years. And the prophecies there and its connections to the book of Revelation. So, uh, if you're curious, I think Joe's got that on video and we'll be posting it up to the Facebook webs. Well, actually YouTube, but the link is on our Facebook page for the church. And um, can't seem to get out of the book of Daniel. <clears throat> this morning I'd like for you to turn to Daniel chapter 3. And we want to read the entire chapter in order to get the context. And we're taking our thoughts primarily from two verses, but to get the context for what led up to those verses, uh, we want to read the whole chapter. And I, I know uh, last month we had a, our uh, quarterly fellowship, and we had dinner after the morning service, and then we reassembled, and we tried doing it a little differently, and we had more of a, a singing service and brought a short devotion. And our devotion was on this thought, but um, I had been working on a paper I want to use as a handout if, Lord willing, if we become a chaplain with the fire department and uh, primarily we uh, going on fire calls uh, like the one that was back here behind us. And it's kind of a handout to help people uh, that have experienced and suffered a loss by fire like that. And, of course, I thought of this chapter, the third chapter of Daniel, about the three Hebrew children that was thrown into the fiery furnace. And have been studying on that, developing some thoughts, and, and I wanted to expound upon that then this morning, because I think there's a, a blessing in that for us as we go through different trials in, in our life. So Daniel chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar, the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye shall fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image, and whoso falleth not down and worshipeth that he should be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? <clears throat> Now if ye be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast that same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace uh, one, uh, seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. And these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the fourth is the and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. Nor was a hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be God, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has set his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. And read earlier, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these were Chaldean names that had been given to them, had already been promoted, and were among the princes uh, and the rulers of Babylon, and there was a jealousy against them, so this opportunity arose. Uh, those other rulers were quick to point out that they had failed to obey the king's commandment. And I know this has been a long text, but I want us to have the whole context. However, we're taking our thought from uh, just the two verses, chapter, uh, verses 24 and 25. Uh, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said to his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto the king, True, O king. 
He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So our, our thought this morning is on the fourth man. Now, as we look at this and, and how this applies to us, uh, there are certain truths set forth here in this text. And this is given to us, and God has preserved this by His inspiration for our benefit. He says that these things were written for uh, to be examples to us. And so there is examples here that is beneficial to us as God's people. Now, we live, and man, nature has always been the same. And so there is nothing new under the sun as we've been studying on Wednesday nights now in the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, that which has been will, will be, and that which we're seeing now has been before, and, and so on. Uh, and for this reason, these examples are beneficial and applicable to us today. We see that God's people, when we are obedient to God, when we choose to obey God and not man, Jesus tells us if any man will live godly, he will suffer persecution. And so we see a persecution here uh, delivered upon Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I don't know what happened to Daniel. He was a ruler too, but he's not mentioned in this. Of course, he gets his turn in the lines then later. But um, we see these three Hebrew children that said, Our God, you know, never kind of said, Who is your God that he can deliver you from this? Our God is able if he chooses to do so. But even if he does, even if we perish, we want you to know we will not worship your gods. We will not bow down and worship this image. The world is constantly demanding of us as God's people that we obey their wishes, even when it's contrary to the commandments of God. There are many different examples that we could give of this. Uh, but men pass their laws and sometimes their laws would compel us to do things or to accept things which we feel are contrary to the word of God and we are to be obedient to God in all things at all times now that being said there are in our life, in our walk with the Lord, we are constantly facing trials and tribulations. Job, in the, the midst of his sorrow and his loss, cried out, Man that is born of woman is few of days and full of troubles. And that was his perspective in the midst of trouble. Uh, when you're in the midst of trouble, it seems like that's the only thing that you can see. And so we face many trials, troubles, adversities in our lives. And when we do, we should remember a lesson here from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That when they endured their trials, and whatever the source or the nature of the trials, it may not have anything to do with uh, having to bow down and, and worship something else, but because of sin, 
in the world and because of sin in us, because of that curse that is upon us, we will face trials. We will face adversity. We will face loss in our lives. And that is just a part of life. And it goes with living. And we need to prepare ourselves uh, and expect that those things will come. And when we do, and we experience those, let us remember some things here. That Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were enduring their fiery trial, was not alone. There was the fourth man, whom Nebuchadnezzar says in his form, is like the Son of God. And that's who it was. Jesus Christ was present and walking with the three Hebrew children uh, in this fiery furnace. And we see that one of the things we notice here is that they were not hurt of the fire. The fire had no power over them. Uh, it said their hair wasn't singed. I've, I've had my hair singed more than once. You don't have to be directly in a fire. You just be close enough to uh, enough heat and it'll singe your hair. And they were in the midst of a furnace, a fire so hot that it killed the very soldiers that cast them in. You know, that's one of the things as God's people and through God's promises, those things which would overcome others, those adversities that would absolutely destroy other people, we can endure them and not just endure them but be overcomers and conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. And that's what I want to, to look at here. Uh, the only thing that was burned was their bonds. That which bound them, that which fettered them, that was the only thing that was consumed in the flame but said their bodies was not harmed, their hair was not singed, neither was their clothes scorched, and there wasn't even the smell of smoke upon them when they came out. I remember we went through and experienced a fire, and we were very blessed because we didn't lose anything. Um, we woke up in the morning, a house full of smoke, saw the wall scorched where the fire was inside the wall because of a wall heater. Got everybody up and out of the house, called 911. And then, typical, and I, this is the very thing they said, don't do it, don't do it. But I did the typical thing, I went back in, was rescuing some of my books. I, I did, I, didn't, I, I couldn't drag loose piano out, but I moved it away from the wall. So I was thinking of you. <laughs> I, I moved her beloved piano away from the wall because it was sitting on the wall close to where the, the fire was. And then I, started, I got Gil and Matthew <laughs> and started collecting my, my books and carrying them out and going back in. I think I, I made about two trips when the police got there and they said, you're not going back in. So we stood and the fire department went in and they put out the fire. And the house remained kind of closed up. And there wasn't any fire. There was no fire damage to any of our belongings. There was no water damage to any of our belongings. And even after, a, I don't know, a month or, or how long it was that that house sat there and our things sat there in that house and we retrieved them, we were thinking, well, you know, smell of smoke. There wasn't even the smell of smoke on our stuff. 
So the Lord blessed. And, and, and there's a real life situation where even the smell of the smoke was upon. The Lord brought us through that. I believe that that fourth man was there with us that day. And he's promised to be with us through the, the trials in our life. But, and that's what I want us to think about. And, and as we, we think about these things and realize it's when we walk with the Lord and are obedient to do His will, there is naught that can overcome us, but we are the overcomers and the conquerors of our circumstances. And that's what Paul says in Romans 8. When he's talking about these things, and he asks the question, what can separate us from the, the love of God? And verse 35, when he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? But then he mentions the circumstances, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. These are circumstances. And he's saying that in all these things we are more than conquerors. And then he goes on to mention other things too. Principal life, death, angels, principalities, demons, you know. It doesn't matter. Nothing can separate us as a child of God from the love of God which is given to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, so we are more than other overcomers. Now, I want us to think about three valuable truths that correlate with this, but we find them in the writings of Paul when he wrote to the church which is at Corinth. And we find one of these in uh, 1 Corinthians and two of them in 2 Corinthians, and I'm, I'm kind of taking them in the order uh, that they, they we find them here. In 1 Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul makes this statement. In verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able uh, to bear it. And so there, there's three thoughts here, and, and I have labeled this first point is his company. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We do not go through these trials alone. That fourth man is always present with us. Jesus, the Son of God. Number one, the universality of our circumstances. He says, there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common. To man. Now, at the time, it may seem, we, you know, our circumstances may seem unique. It may seem, I, I'm the only one that, you know, you feel like you're the only one that has gone through anything like this particular situation you're going through. But you're not. No, we talked about, you know, what Solomon says there in the book of Ecclesiastes. There's nothing new under the sun. That which is today is that which has already been in the past, and that which is happening today will occur again in some time in the future. There's nothing new under the sun. Uh, we've pointed out many times that this is due to the fact that human nature does not change. The basic needs of man, the basic desires of man, the basic weaknesses of sin nature, the temptations that Satan cast our way, there's nothing new. They're universal. And so one thing that, and this 
is intended to comfort us, not that misery loves company, but to comfort us from the fact that there have been others that have endured and experienced similar circumstances in their lives. And with God's help, they overcame. It's not that we're told this so that we can take comfort in the misery of others, but that we can take comfort in the example of the success of others, the conquering of others, the overcoming of others over their circumstances because of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives. We see here another point. It says, God is faithful. And he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He is faithful. And not only that, but we see here, it says, God uh, will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. That is, God knows you. If you're a child of God, God knows you. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your limitations. And He has a purpose for your life. And he's not going to allow anything to come into your life that he does not allow it or purpose it for your good. You read there in Romans, all things work together for good. For the called. Those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Now all things don't work good for the wicked. But all things work together for good to those who are the call. Those who love God for His people. And He knows. And He says that with this temptation, with this trial, He has provided a way of escape. Now, there's a couple of things here that we need to understand when he says that he won't allow any more to come upon you than what you're able to stand. That is able with his help. You know, we cannot withstand these trials and tribulations alone in our own strength. When we try to do it in our own strength, we will fail. But when we lean upon Him, when we acknowledge His presence, when we are obedient to Him and seeking His will, He will show us the way through it. You know, there are many times our way would be, God, just remove it. Take it away. But He doesn't do that. When the children of Israel in the wilderness had sinned and he sent the fiery serpents among them and those that were bitten of the serpents died and they prayed God did not remove the serpents but he provided a healing a curing uh, for their body and that was the brazen serpent that was raised up he said now if you're bitten by the serpent you look to this and you'll live. As a matter of fact, that very image was used as an example of Jesus Christ that in like manner He's lifted up on the cross to die for our sins and when we look to Him in faith, we shall live. We shall have the forgiveness of sin and we shall have everlasting life. Now, the old sin nature is not removed. The serpents, you know, Satan's still there. That old sin nature is still there, but we have a Savior uh, that provides forgiveness of sin, that provides healing, that provides comfort to us. And He will open a way, make a way of escape that you will be able to bear it. And I believe that will 
involve us being obedient to Him. You cannot expect to be disobedient to God, to rebel against Him, to ignore His Word, to do, just do your own thing and, and say, yeah, I know that God would rather I didn't do that and He'd rather I was doing something else, but I'm going to do this here, and expect that you're going to get through those trials like that. You know, that's when we are overcome. But when we humble ourselves and we seek His face, isn't that what He said there in the Old Testament? My people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, and then will I heal their land. And so we see his coming. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, let us move on here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Here we see the comfort of God expressed, and this is one of the things, you know, I'm sure it was quite a, a scary thing when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were cast into the midst of that burning fiery furnace. But the presence of the fourth man, the presence of the Son of God with them was a comfort to them as they walked in the midst of that fire. Again, he didn't put the fire out. He didn't transport them out of the fire. But the whole time they were in there, he was with them. He walked with them. And God is with us in our trials and in our tribulations, in our affliction. And he walks with us and he is a comfort to us. His presence comforts us. And he will walk with us through the fire. One of the things we see here is how that he comes alongside. Matter of fact, the Greek word there, uh, when uh, Jesus said that God will send a comforter, the comforter uh, is a Greek word paraclete, uh, not parakeet, but paraclete, uh, which has the idea of one who comes alongside, one who walks with it even has the idea of the one who goes before us to clear the way before us, the one who comes behind to, you know, he's, he's guarding. The military idea is, is when you're walking in enemy territory, you have four positions that you want to cover. You have somebody out on point, you have somebody on the flanks, and you have somebody as the rear guard, guarding them behind you. And that's the idea of the paraclete. He comes alongside us. He walks with us. But he's also in point ahead of us, making sure, clearing the way and, and, and spotting any dangers ahead of us. He's protecting our flanks so we don't get blindsided from him. He's also behind us, protecting us from behind that we don't uh, get taken by surprise. He is the comforter. And he comes alongside us. And, and the idea then too that we see here and is that when we go through a trial and we are comforted and there are certain things that we know that was a comfort to us that we experience when we're walking with God and he's with us and he makes his presence known to us and it is such a comfort to us there may be certain verses of Scripture. It may be a hymn or something that we hear uh, that God uses at that particular moment to encourage us and, and, and just makes it real to us and it, it strengthens us and, and it's such a blessing to us. And it gets us through that circumstance, that trial, that affliction, whatever it may be. 
God has equipped us. And then, and in doing so, we realize He used this person, He used that person. Who was it that shared that verse of Scripture? Who was it that picked out that hymn? Uh, you know, who was it that just uh, came alongside, put their arm around you and hugged you? Didn't have to say anything, but just it, it made it comforted you. Uh, this is how God sends His comfort. He has prepared them to be a comfort to you, has used them to comfort you. And now when you see someone else that is going through a trial, there's nothing new under the sun, uh, you have experienced something along those lines and you know how that God uh, was a comfort to you and so you come alongside that person and you be a comfort to them. But see, God prepares people and it is God who is comforting us that's coming alongside us through that human agency. And, um, and so be aware of that. And uh, we thank God for uh, His blessings and His comfort. Uh, many times that comfort may be His personal presence. Sometimes that comfort is how that God uses other people in our lives to be a comfort to us. But it goes back to Him. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, we see His compassion. Here, Paul was afflicted. He says, a thorn in the flesh. But God had sent it. God had a purpose in it. It was to humble Paul. It was to balance out uh, the great visions and wisdom and knowledge that God had given Paul to balance that out so that he would not be puffed up with pride. But at the same time, Paul didn't like that thorn in the flesh. He felt like it, it hindered him. It limited him in some way. And so he asked God, prayed God to take it away. And then God come alongside and spoke to him and said, no, so I'm not going to take it away. He says, but my grace is sufficient for thee. My grace. Now that's a word that we use a lot and we hear a lot. But sometimes I think we take for granted and fail to grasp the depths of the meaning of that word. My grace. That we talk about from theology, it's, it's unmerited favor, but it's the favor. God favors us. And that favor, that comfort, that blessing, that presence is sufficient for all our needs. And he goes on to say, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God's strength is brought forth. It is matured. It is worked out through our weakness. When we're weak, and that's why Paul, when he understood this, said, hey, I'd rather glory in my infirmities now. You know. Because I know when I'm weak, when I see my weakness and acknowledge my weakness and realize I can't do this myself, then I look to God, my comforter, and He strengthens me. You know, the sufficiency of God's grace. Do not underestimate it or take it for granted. God's grace and what it can do for you. God told Paul, my grace is sufficient. So you don't need me to take this away from you. It's there for a reason. And yes, it makes life more difficult for you. But my grace is sufficient to make up that difficulty, that difference. My grace is able to come alongside and give you strength where you're weak. And so, God's strength is made manifest through our weakness. We see Paul then writes in, in, to the Philippians. He, he shares some of this experience and wisdom with the Philippians then that he has gained here. And so you notice in, in Philippians 2.13, he says, It is God that 
worketh in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. See, the presence of God, God's grace. And his, he said, it's God that worketh in you. He, he said, now you work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. He said, but understand, it's God that worketh in you. You're not doing it on your own. You're not doing it by yourself. It's God who is present with you. Then he says in chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things. That, that talk, speaks of ability and power there. Paul was weak. You know, he... You know, we, we think of different people and stereotypes. And... Did you ever stop to imagine what kind of a person was Paul, really? I mean, he's a giant of faith. He was an apostle. But he was a nerd. You know, in our society, he'd be considered an academic. You know, the little old nutty professor at the spectacle, he had poor eyesight, they think that's probably what he was complaining about, that from the stoning that he had received, it damaged his eyesight, left him, you know, partially blind, but weak-eyed, and, and he, he depended on others to write for him a lot of times, and, and his writing had to be so large because of his poor eyesight. But anyway, different things, but he, he was this, he was a small man, small of stature, he was just this, you know, little academic, nerdish type of person. He's not the great adventurer, the you know, that you know, we think of Paul that set sail and was ship endured shipwreck and, and imprisonment and, and beatings and robberies and in peril on the roads and in peril at sea and all these things that he Yeah. Here's this little the speckled, frail academic that's doing all those things. We, we look at him and say, man, he, he could never do all that. Well, he couldn't. But God's grace is sufficient. So, you know, whenever you think of yourself and say, well, I can't do anything. I can't do this. And, well, that's the position that Paul was in. And God revealed to him that God was present with him and his grace was sufficient to see God's compassion here and, and toward Paul and my grace is sufficient for you and then my strength is able to be manifested and perfected in you through your weakness. And so Paul says, hey, it's God that worketh in you. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When he wrote to the Ephesians, he said, Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. And then in Philippians 4.19, he says, But my God. You know, it, what was it? The, the three Hebrew children, you know, and, and Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar. What's his God of yours? What can he do? He found out. Our God. Our God is able to deliver us if He chooses to do so. Paul says, My God. See, I know whom I believe. And I am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. I know. And my God shall supply all your need through Christ. Whatever that need may be. And so as we think of these statements. Remember, when you're facing some trouble, some adversity of life, don't despair. Don't give up. But look to Christ who will walk beside you through the fire. The flames will not hurt you, but set you free from the things which would bind you. 
But remember, too, they were obedient to God and submissive to His sovereign will. Let us commit ourselves into His loving hands, trusting in His grace, and follow His word. There is no fire kindled that can harm the soul of a child of God. We are safe in Him. And He, as that fourth man, walks beside us through all of our trials, whatever they may be. And in Him, because of His presence, we can be encouraged and take comfort knowing that there is the hope we're not alone and there is help for us in our times of need let us stand then because in some hymn let us consider these things Consider Jesus Christ, the fourth man there in the fire. He is our Savior who loved us and gave himself for us that we might have the forgiveness of sin, that we might have eternal life. And he is our comforter and the one who walks beside us all the way and has promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us. 131.